Um, a few announcements to get us started. There's no Bible study tonight. The So Awesome group meets tomorrow at 9 until whenever you can't stand each other anymore and you can go home. And then um, our church every year uh, volunteers to deliver peace meals in the community of Cisna Park. So in the month of July, uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the back table for days if you feel that you can uh, do that uh, delivery. Um, it says here there's 8 to 12 meals delivered, delivered starting at 1050. The St. John's Lutheran Church at Schwer is hosting a prayer breakfast on the 4th of July starting at 7 a.m. The program begins at 8 a.m. with special music prayers and there's going to be a guest speaker, Pastor Aaron Upoff. Um, donations will be sent to the local food pantries. Um, Sunday, July 10th through Thursday the 14th are the dates for uh, Vacation Bible School from 6 to 8 p.m. Let Abby know if you can make cookies. Or really, if you just want to make cookies and bring them to the house, I'll make sure that they're fine for all the kids. Um, we want to welcome Edward Marvin, the newest son born to Joseph and Kat Schmid on Thursday night. There's going to be a meal train organized and uh, there will be more information to follow. And as a recipient of one of the meal trains years ago, they are stupendous. Are there any other announcements? Are there any prayer requests that we haven't mentioned? or not in the bulletin yet. I have a prayer request here for um, Todd Shively. Todd Shively, you know, has been going through a lot with his uh, affliction, and he had a cell transplant and is doing very well with that, but now he's contracted COVID. So please be in prayer for him. And you know, because of his treatments and his condition, he didn't get a vaccination or anything like that. So. Please pray that his symptoms are light and that his body fights through this very well. Um, also, my father-in-law, Ron, he had a bad Thursday is probably the best way to explain it. He's back in the hospital right now. Um, they are go he's undergoing tests to see if um, he'll be able to handle a valve replacement. They've known about the bad valve in his heart for a long time. They've been monitoring it and now they're, they're considering fixing that. So pray for Ron as he's, uh, he's, in, the, he's in Urbana right now and they're you know, do, gonna be doing some testings over the next couple days to find out what they can do for him. And also let's pray for um, the Liz Yergler family as Liz passed last night in the hospital. So please be in prayer for uh, Fred and Mike and Joe as they mourn the loss of their mom. Are there any other, anything else? Well, it seems awful sad announcements this morning, cheapers. Let's, uh, Bruce, you better get up here and cheer everybody up. That comes with everything, doesn't it? Would you stand and join me in singing, I worship you, almighty God. special this morning. Emma, would you come and present for us this morning? Mm -hmm. 
Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the son of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. As for a man, his days are like grass, as the flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, in his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him, doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Thank you, Emma. Now would you turn to his mercy as more? What love could remember no wrongs we have done? I'm wish it all knowing he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or floor. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What His mercy is more stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the violent the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more he's the lord his mercy His mercy. 
God. That's a new song. Um, the whole family sang it at Katie's graduation, and it's a great song, so I'd like to try it this morning. video and then Josh will come and share his message. It's hard to imagine where I'd be without you. The truth is I've learned so much by simply watching you. I've learned what it means to care about people and put others before myself. I've learned how to live a life of integrity and have the heart of a servant. I've learned to honor God in all I do and seek his will for my life. Thank you for the discipline I deserved and the grace I did not. Thank you for guiding me, encouraging me, and picking me up when I failed. Thank you for living out your faith and showing me how to live out mine. As I look back, I can see moment after moment where your strength, your wisdom, and your love made all the difference. There's so much of you I carry with me, memories I treasure, and lessons I cherish. Today, Dad, I want to say thank you and let you know just how much I love you. Happy Father's Day. Good morning. And if you want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 9, Happy Father's Day. And thank you for all the Happy Father's Day wishes for me. I appreciate that. Uh, special thanks to Bruce and to Anna Joe who uh, stepped in at the last minute to play piano for us this morning. 
and uh, it's been great. I, I can't imagine, uh, but very much appreciated, and you guys did a great job. Uh, First Samuel chapter 9 is where we'll be this morning. Uh, before we get into the passage, um, yeah, I just wanted to, again, encourage people to keep the Yergler family in your prayers. Um, as I know it's been said this morning, and many of you had probably heard already this morning that Liz passed away, and um, she was a sweet lady. And while we can rejoice in the hope of the gospel and in the hope that all who have faith in Christ enjoy and the promise that she is today in the presence of the Lord and we can rejoice in all of those things. Yet death is still a sad thing. And so just please keep praying for that family in this time. Um, also want to mention, um, and we'll talk more about this in the next few weeks, uh, Empty Tomb, who is a ministry out of the uh, Champaign-Urbana area, who Mark and Andrea do a lot of work with, they have a ministry uh, matching fund that is meant to serve children in impoverished nations around the world. And we applied to uh, participate with them in one of their match grants, which means that the church raises money and they will match what we've raised up to $3,000. And again, we'll talk more about this uh, we've found a wonderful hospital in Ghana that a doctor who serves in Springfield, Illinois, who's from Ghana, has started. And we have an interview that he did um, on a radio program that we'll put on our website and Facebook pages where he talks more about that work. But over 25 years, I think he's been to Ghana about 40 times. Um, and they have this whole clinic that they've established that uh, among other things, treats pregnant women and children, and some of the people who go to this clinic, it's the first time they've ever seen a doctor in their lifetimes. And so uh, we'll be raising money to support that clinic. And if anybody would like to donate today, uh, certainly in checks you can memo uh, Mission Match or Empty Tomb, and it'll get to the right place. And again, excited to do that as a church. Um, one of the goals that Empty Tomb has is for churches to have more awareness of people in impoverished countries, especially children who are dying of curable diseases. Um, and so it's something that they really like to partner with churches and to have the whole church be involved in raising money. It's not so simple. The church can't just write a check for $3,000. It's something that we actually have to, to raise as a church and certainly I know that this church has always been incredibly generous uh, to, to each other, to my family, to the many, many missionaries we support. And um, I know it's a crazy time economically right now, but for those who are able, um, this is something that is going to a cause with this hospital that is uh, going to help save lives. And so, again, we'll talk more about this in the coming weeks, but wanted to acknowledge that today uh, and certainly if you have any questions I'm happy to to talk to you and I'm sure Mark would be as well uh, first Samuel chapter 9 is where we'll be we'll go through the whole chapter this morning there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish the son of Abiel son of Zeror son of Becherah son of Aphiah a Benjaminite a man of wealth and he had a son whose name was Saul a handsome young man there was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul his son, Take one of the young men with you, and arise, go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim, and passed through the land of Shalashish, but they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and, and become anxious about us. <coughs> but he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. 
Then Saul said to his servant, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again, Here, I have with me some I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer, for today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. As they went up to the hill to the city, they met young women coming out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? They answered, He is. Behold, he is just ahead of you. Hurry. He has come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat till he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the, land, from the hand of the Philistines. For I have seen my people, because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me. And in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Saul answered, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? Then Samuel took Saul and his young man and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, of which I said to you, put it aside. So the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set them before Saul. And Samuel said, See, what was kept is set before you. Eat, because it was kept for you until the hour appointed, that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day, and when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Up, that I may send you on your way. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servants to pass on before us, and when he had passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we rejoice in the life of Liz Yergler, Lord, the ways in which she served you and the ways in which you gifted her to use those gifts, Lord, for your glory. Lord, we rejoice in the hope of the gospel, Lord, as the Apostle Paul said in his letter to the Philippians, to be in the presence of the Lord is far better. And that is the hope of the gospel, and Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, for all of us, may that be the thing that day by day, through the darkness, through the sorrow, through the, through the grief of life, may the hope of heaven be our greatest joy. Lord, we rejoice at new life as this baby boy, Edward Schmidt, born this week to Kat and Joe. And Lord, we just thank you so much that he is here and we pray for this baby. Lord, we pray from a young age that he know the love that you have for him. Lord, we pray for Kat and Joe and for the rest of their family as they adjust to a new family member and a new life, Lord. And we just pray for them in these hectic 
first days and weeks with the new baby. I also pray for Kat that she's recuperating well from labor. Lord, we thank you for all the fathers today. Lord, regardless of the situation that people have with our earthly fathers, Lord, we thank you that we have a perfect heavenly father. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the men here today who have raised children, who are raising children. And Lord, we pray that we would do that in a way that is honoring to you. Lord, for people who have had fathers who have passed away, Lord, we pray on this day that they would remember good times and great memories with their fathers, Lord. Lord, for people who have had strained or strenuous relationships with their earthly fathers, again, we just ask that we be pointed to you, Lord, that you are perfect, that you are our Father in heaven. And Lord, we pray for this ministry match that we are participating in with Empty Tomb. And Lord, we just pray for this hospital in Ghana for the work that they've been doing for so many years. And we pray that we can be a blessing to them and for the work that they're continuing to do. Lord, we pray for our time as we study in your word. May we be pointed to the truth of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Any Star Wars fans here? A few? I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest Star Wars fan, but I appreciate the story. And it'll be relevant here at the beginning. In Star Wars, you have Anakin Skywalker, who becomes Darth Vader. He starts out from humble beginnings. He's a slave, but unbeknownst to him, he's set aside for a historic task. A Jedi meets Anakin and senses that Anakin has a strong presence of the Force and that he is chosen, the chosen one who will restore order to the Force. At first, Anakin does a lot of good things. He's a heroic figure. He's serving honorably as a Jedi. He saves an entire planet. He has this priestly figure, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who trains him in the ways of the Jedi. But then he joins the dark side. He becomes Darth Vader. He's evil. He's vengeful. He destroys entire planets. He nearly wipes out the Jedi. He kills his teacher, Obi-Wan. And I give those details because the life of Saul follows a similar trajectory to that of Darth Vader. In our passage today, we are first introduced to Saul, who is a man of humble beginnings. Without knowing it, he finds out that he will be the king of Israel. Saul starts out well and has everything that he needs to succeed before turning to sin in later chapters. And he goes on a downward spiral of destruction and murder. Darth Vader kills off most of the Jedi. Saul kills off all of the high priests except for Abiathar. Both are replaced by greater men, Darth Vader's son, Luke Skywalker. Saul is replaced by David, the greatest of the Israelite kings. Darth Vader has a son, Luke Skywalker, who does not follow the evil ways of his father. Saul has a son, Jonathan, who abdicates any opportunity to the throne and is loyal instead to David. Both have daughters who oppose the evils of their fathers. Princess Leia is a Jedi. Saul's daughter marries David. Saul and David are both anointed by Samuel. Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker are both trained by Obi-Wan. Darth Vader dies on a moon called Endor. Saul dies at a place near Endor. 1 Samuel 28, 7. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her, and his servant said to him, Behold, there is a medium at Endor. Dies in chapter 31 in a place called Gilboa. I think it's safe to say that the writers of Star Wars had a Bible handy when they were writing the script. <laughs> Humble origins, early successes, a turn to evil, and a downward spiral of murder that ends in violent death. And I think the comparison is helpful as we consider the long story arc of King Saul in the book of 1 Samuel. We're continuing in our series, The Rise and Fall of the First King of Israel. Last week, the Israelites demanded a king. The Israelites had been warned about the consequences of having a king. They would have to pay more in taxes. More of their men would serve in the army and fight in wars. The best of their land will be given up to the service of the king. Women will have to work in various trades that will serve the kingdom. 
All of them will be subjects. But in spite of all of that, the people still say that they want a king. In spite of warnings about how poorly for them it would go, they refuse to listen. And today we see the origins of Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 9. He becomes the king of Israel in the following chapter, chapter 10. And so this morning, with the time we have, we're going to look at three scenes in 1 Samuel 9, beginning with Saul's humble beginnings. Verse 1, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Becherah, son of Aphiah, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. As is often the case in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, when a new person is introduced, we see a family line given to introduce that person. The Benjaminites were one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they were the smallest of the tribes numerically. Other noteworthy Benjaminites in the Bible include Esther and the Apostle Paul. The verse also mentions that the family was wealthy. Verse 2, And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. Now, does that kind of remind you guys of someone? <laughs> From his head and shoulders upwards, he was taller than any of the people. Okay, next verse. <laughs> Physical descriptions of people are actually pretty rare in the Bible. We don't even know what Jesus looked like. There's no physical description of how he looked. But first, Samuel mentions that Saul was a tall, handsome man. I'll say more about this, Lord willing, next week, but Saul's appearance matters to the story. Saul's the only Israelite in the entire Bible who's referred to as being tall. And he's one of only a handful of people in the Bible referred to as being handsome. And so now that the general introductory comments have been told about Saul... The author gets into the story, verse 3. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, Take one of the young men with you and arise, go and look for the donkeys. So Saul might have come from a wealthy family, but we're introduced to him having to engage in a fairly inglorious task of going out into the wilderness to search for these donkeys. Verses 4 and 5. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim, and passed through the land of Shelishish, but they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. So the author is still talking about these donkeys seems that the author is trying to show us the simple life that Saul was living. He's going to be the king, but here he's just simply going to do what his father told him to do. Again, he's just some Benjaminite, the smallest tribe. While his family seems well off, they're not even the most prominent family within their tribe. Saul has no ambition at all to be the king. How could he? Israel has never had a king. It's kind of like how I imagine George Washington doubted growing up with dreams of being the president. There wasn't one. Saul has no aspiration of being the leader of Israel. So Saul is with one of his servants looking for the donkeys, and they've wandered into this small town called Zuf. Still no donkeys. But they've gone for a while, and Saul starts to worry that his father is going to start to worry. But the servant makes a suggestion. Verse 6. But he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true, so now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. The servant refers to a man of God in the city. The man of God is the prophet Samuel. Samuel is essentially the leader over Israel. He's not a king, but he's known throughout the land. For instance, earlier in this book, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 20, says, And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. Back in our passage. So it's not Saul that has the idea to seek out Samuel. 
It's his servant who has the idea. The servant knows Samuel, and Saul doesn't. And Saul's the future king. So Saul's servant suggests Saul seek out Samuel to find some donkeys. Saul responds, and he's uncertain. Verse 7. Then Saul said to his servant, there's a lot of S's in this chapter, by the way. If we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? Culturally, he feels like he needs to have some sort of gift if he's going to travel to see this great prophet Samuel. His servant happens to have some silver on him in verse 8, and so the two men go in pursuit of Samuel. After a quick note in verses 9 and 10 that they felt that they needed to have this gift, verses 11 and 12, their journey is interrupted when they come upon a group of women. So Saul and his servant are looking for Samuel, and the women tell Saul and his servant that Samuel has just returned to the city. As they went up to the hill to the city, they met young women coming out to draw water and said to them, is the seer here? They answered, he is. Behold, he is just ahead of you. Hurry, he has come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. So the women tell Saul and his servant to hurry because Samuel has to perform a sacrifice that day. Verse 13, as soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat till he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. So the women are talking about this feast that Samuel is preparing. Unbeknownst to the women and unknown to Saul, the feast is for him. Verse 14. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place, which leads to our second scene. Saul meets the prophet Samuel. So Saul's just minding his own business, trying to find some donkeys. What he didn't know is that Samuel had a vision the day before that would change Saul's life. Verse 15 and 16. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be the prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. In this verse, the ESV uses the word prince. Different translations use a different word there. Some say prince, some translations say leader, some say captain. What the word specifically isn't saying is king. In fact, the word king is not found anywhere in this chapter because it's pointing out that God is still the true king of Israel. And so in this passage, we see the providential hand of God. The Lord is going to bring the future king before Samuel. Providence can be a complicated thing. Some people look at life as just a random series of events with nothing being connected, no meaning to any of it. In the Bible, we see numerous stories where God's guiding hand of providence is leading. We see it in the story of Joseph, as the Lord takes a man who was betrayed by his own brothers and uses Joseph to end up saving Israel and saving his brother Judah, from whose line Jesus would come into the world. We see providence in the book of Ruth when a young woman who's a widow and has nothing moves away from her homeland to Bethlehem. And it is there where a relative of her deceased husband, a man named Boaz, marries Ruth, and they have a son who's the grandfather of King David. You have these series of events in the Bible where the end result would not have happened had one thing changed. A razor's edge. And we see the providential hand of God working throughout the Old Testament, throughout the history of Israel, throughout the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the way to David, all the way to Joseph and Mary, through whom Jesus came into the world. God providentially working. We see the providence of God through Paul's missionary journeys. Successes, but also 
incredible setbacks, arrests, beatings, places he couldn't travel to, but all of it for the purpose of God as his work and his gospel was being spread throughout the world. Those events were not random. The Lord is working in his world. He is working in history, he is working today, and he's working in our own lives. In this passage, Samuel is told that he will meet a Benjaminite whom he is to anoint. Anointing was done for the prophets, priests, and now it'll be done for the kings. In Genesis, after the flood, as the dove brought back an olive branch, and as olive oil was used in lighting the menorah in the temple, the oil became a sign of the presence and empowering spirit of the Lord. Samuel will anoint Saul, and the passage says that Saul will save the people from the Philistines. And Saul does do that, but then he fails as a leader, and the Philistines regroup and continue to afflict the Israelites for generations. Earlier in 1 Samuel, the Philistines defeated the Israelites in battle, and they actually confiscated the Ark of the Covenant. It's interesting that Samuel is this respected leader in Israel, and he knows who this obscure Benjaminite Saul is. But Saul doesn't know who Samuel is. In his day, Samuel was probably the most revered Israelite since the time of Moses. Verse 17, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Samuel sees the future king. Verse 18, the future king sees Samuel. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, where is the house of the seer? Saul walks up to Samuel and asks him where he can go to find Samuel. Again, Samuel is pretty important. He's famous throughout all the land, and yet Saul doesn't know who he is. And that brings us to our third scene. Saul, invites, Saul is invited to eat with Samuel. Verse 19. Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. Again, while Saul doesn't know who the seer is, Samuel knows who Saul is. Even though Saul is from this small and unassuming tribe, Samuel knows who he is. He tells Saul to rest and to eat with him. Saul has no idea that his life and the future of Israel are about to change. But what about the donkeys? Verse 20. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? There we see Samuel having apparently supernatural knowledge of Saul's predicament and what he's worried about. The idea being conveyed here is that Saul and his family from the small tribe of Benjamin are going to fulfill the hopes of Israel for a king. Saul's thinking, I just wanted to find my donkeys. But Samuel has hit him with an astounding declaration. And so Saul responds with disbelief. Verse 21, Saul answered, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my claim the humblest of all the clans of the tribes of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me this way? And that's something that you will also see in chapter 10, that Saul doesn't really want to be the king. After Samuel tells this news to Saul, there's a banquet. Again, back in verse 11, when Saul had run into the group of women who had mentioned the banquet, there's no way he could have had any idea that he was going to be the guest of honor. Verse 22, then Samuel took Saul and his young man and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about 30 persons. And it's all for Saul. Verse 23. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, of which I said to you, put it aside. So the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set them before Saul. And Samuel said, See, what was kept is set before you. 
Eat, because it was kept for you until the hour appointed that you might eat with the guests. So the day before, Samuel had had his cook set aside the best portion of the food for the future king, even though he didn't yet know who that person would be. That again points to the providence of God leading the story. For Saul, he's receiving the best portion, something he's probably not used to in his culture. For a meal that he had never planned on attending or being invited to. It's a pretty crazy story when you think about it. Excuse me. Saul doesn't actually even yet know that he's been chosen to be the future king. Samuel hasn't told him that yet. Verse 24. So Saul ate with Samuel that day, and when they had come down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, up that I may send you on your way. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. Saul's invited to sleep on the roof. By our standards, that might seem unusual. It's something that culturally, in the Middle East, in certain areas, people still do as a custom. Um, again, a little bit odd to our circumstances. As hot as it was this week, I was talking to my dad a couple days ago, and he said he was driving around and saw a guy hanging out on his roof, and he said it couldn't possibly be any, any more comfortable, uh, you know, surrounded by the shingles and uh, to be hanging out up there. Verse 27. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us, and when he has passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make, make known to you the word of God. So Samuel wants to have a moment in private with Saul. He's being prepared. Again, he doesn't yet know the full extent of what he's about to be told. That comes in chapter 10 when he becomes anointed to be the king. But Saul is being set aside to be told this news. Again, all throughout this chapter, we see the providential hand of God at work. Saul finds out his calling while he's searching for some lost donkeys. For other biblical figures, Abraham has a divine encounter when he's at the entrance of a tent. God spoke to Moses in a burning bush when he was tending to his sheep. Another man named Saul, better known as the Apostle Paul, was hunting down Christians to persecute them and walking down the road to Damascus when Jesus appeared to him. Events so dramatic don't happen all the time, but God is no less at work today. The things people do, the people we are, the backgrounds we have, the things that happen, all of it is for a purpose. And we have an opportunity within those things to serve the Lord and be part of his story. Saul had his chance and ultimately will fall into sin. Instead of being an example of grace in the Bible, he becomes an example of just how far we can fall. The Israelites had demanded a king and were told that it would go poorly for them. As I said in the beginning, more taxes, loss of land, everyone would be a subject but they wanted a king nonetheless. Perhaps you wonder why Saul failed if he was the man whom God had chosen. Because Saul was a fallible man. And fallible people will never be the world's ultimate hope. Even good kings in Israel had their failings. But a king would come who would be the ultimate savior of Israel and of the world. And Saul points to that, and David points to that, and all of the kings of Israel point to that. The main character in this book is not Samuel, it's not Saul, it's not even David. The main character in 1 Samuel is God, who, despite the failures of his kings, remains the ultimate sovereign over Israel, who is leading his people and his kingdom. That was true in the days of Saul, and it's still true today that God is the king. He is the king of this day. He is the king of our lives. And we should live our lives in worship and honor and service to the true king and to his true kingdom. Would you pray with me? 
Our Heavenly Father, once again, we just thank you for this day, and we thank you for your word that points us to you. And Lord, there are so many things to stress about and to worry about, especially in these times that we're living through. Lord, through all of that, may we know that you are no less at work, that you are aware of what is going on. Lord, may we walk in the faith and the knowledge of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's close our service by singing Be Still and Know, hymn number 630 in the hymnal. Would you stand, please? <clears throat> Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a good week.